and we are going to we're going to spend an hour this afternoon just talking about some changes that is happen that are happening in in our world today. So we're going to talk about the uh, browning and grain of America today, and so. I'm excited as that has been something that we have uh, been talking about in our space now for, for a while, and now it's here. And so uh, we're going, first, let me say this. I'm a firm believer that whenever you connect with anyone, whether it's virtual or in person, that you leave something with the person and the person will leave something with you. So yes, this will be an interactive um, uh, event, if you will. Just think when you look, as I look down at the participants of all of the experience and knowledge that we have present today. And so, yes, we will, um, we will be, you will hear a lot from me, but I will be asking from input from from everyone that's, that's present today. So with that, we're going to get started. Um, yes, my name is Lydia Thacker and um, I retired, now it's gonna be two years. Time flies when you're having fun um, as Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the Metro Atlanta YMCA, where I worked with them for, that was like my third career, but I worked with them for about 24 years. And so with that, we're going to get started. If we... Thought I heard something. Okay, so we're going to go on and get started with the conversation that we'll have today. We are talking about browning and aging of the population. As drivers for our work. Um, Not yet. Okay, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't anything that uh, and somebody wasn't trying to communicate to, to us. So we're going to look at a few steps that we could help to steer our work environments towards diversity, equity, and inclusivity, if you will, um, in those particular, particular areas. We'll have some suggestions and opportunities, maybe the beginnings of some strategies, as well as we welcome that from any of the participants as well. So with that, let's let's go, let's move on. So we know that the workforce has uh, has been evolving, if you will, and changing. We have several generations in our workforce now. And as you can see, we um, and there's been a lot a lot of talk about the multiple generations in our workforce. My um, my last assignment, there were five in the workforce. It was the Metro Atlanta YMCA. So, you know, we started employing individuals in their teen years. And um, we took, we've had a quick assessment of our C-suite right before COVID hit. And out of 12 people in the, um, in the group, there were seven that had already reached age 65 or over. And so just think about what would happen when, the, when that exodus hit, if you will. And so one of the things that we consider when we talk about the multiple generations in the workplace is how everyone works, how they best work, how they best interact, what is everybody looking for? And so this was just an example of the difference in generation, between generations and just how they felt about workspace and what was more important to the silent generation, which was the, um, the um, 55 and over, if you will. So they thought about physical comfort while um, the least important was acoustic or privacy. Um, boomers, acoustic privacy meeting spaces was important and engaging in the workplace. And so this we, um, just an example of the differences that one has to consider when you have different generations in the workplace. With that, we're going to ask you, how many generations do you have in your workplace? Zero to two? Is it three to four? 
Do you have four to five? I'm seeing in the chat four to five. One thing I'd like to hear from individual four to five, four to five, that seems to be very popular. I'd like for you to think of a challenge, an advantage that that provides and a challenge. And I really would like to hear from a few of you if you would like to share. So how many generations do you have in your workplace? And can you identify a, an advantage to that and one challenge? And with that, um, I'm looking to see if we have raised hands. I don't see any raised hands. Uh, okay. Let's see, would anybody like to, if you would like to come off mute, just come off mute and just go ahead, go for it. Um, I don't know how many we have, but we have a lot. I work over at Georgia Tech. Um, one of the ben benefits, um, how do I say this? Um, they help me be, be, be mindful of, the, of, of how to navigate um, landmines because they come to the table with history, especially our seasoned professionals in the population, they come with history experiences. So I'm not that wild card just flying off in meetings or, or telling it like it is. The other, um, I guess the opportunity would be, um, they're not sometimes uh, as hip with, um, with taking risk. Okay, okay, interesting, interesting. That's. That's one of the um, benefits when you look at multiple generations is the, um, the history, if you will, that some of your more seasoned um, workforce may have. Is there anyone else that would like to share an advantage and a challenge with having, I saw lots of four to five generations in the workplace. We have some in the chat. <clears throat> Denise Massey said advantage mentoring across generations disadvantaged communication styles. Mm -hmm. We have Kimberly Carter, advantage consistency, disadvantaged conflict. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Leslie. I would say that um, what I found, and I work in um, a health system with hospitals and clinics and um, have um, youth that are volunteering to elderly um, that are working in volunteering, meaning you know, I think my oldest volunteer is 87 years old. Um, um, and I've got employees well into their 70s as well. But I think one of the benefits of having that multi-generational workforce is that for what I found is that it really, really um, not only um, drives innovation, but we found that it also builds um, the talent pipeline in a lot of um, instances. And I will chime in in terms of some of the challenges is definitely there are differences in um, communication styles and what I've even found even more is differences in work practices and um, how the different generations tend to collaborate um, among the other generations and then just the expectations they have um, around work-life balance. Thanks. Okay, great. Those were some um, great comments, if you will. And it's not anything that would be even particular just to, to your workspace. What we found out when, um, because we were seeing uh, the issues around communication styles being different. Um, and so really, it really took having um, to pull staff in and making sure that we, that we had groups that with different generations and to actually talk about how we, our preferred work style, how we prefer to communicate and why. And um, although there were many who, especially some with the younger workforce, it was a quick email, even if it was to the individual that was in the cubby next to them. And so, but once they understood the, um, the opportunities of face-to-face -face and developing relationships, they could understand why the, you know, just do, using technology all the time may not have been um, an advantage. So it was more giving the opportunity for the different groups to, to meet. We had concerns with how we work. I can do a lot of work from home, but I want, I, you know, 
The supervisor believed in FaceTime. If you weren't at work, I didn't know if you were working or not. And so it took um, investing time in pulling the, the, the groups together so that they could share. Um, and we found that to be um, advantageous for, for many of them. Did anybody else want to share advantages and challenges to multi-generations in the workplace? Okay, so we'll move on. And so we've covered that one, so we'll go on to the next. Alrighty, so here is um, just a, a quick short video that we got from the Census Bureau, just to talk about the changes in demographics, recent changes. I have to stop my video. <clears throat> Excuse me, my system is moving slow. Okay, you want me to go ahead and start it now? Yes. Okay, let me know if you can hear it. Can you hear it? No. Mm -mm. Can you hear it? No. Okay. Hold on. What about now? Yes. Perfect. The United Thank States you. is an aging country. Today, there are more middle-aged people in the U.S. than children. And by 2060, there will be more elderly than young children. But the U.S. population didn't always look like this. Back in 1860, the country was quite young. If we divided it into age groups for men and women, and then stacked older groups on top of younger ones, we can visualize the age structure of the population. 1860 had a classic pyramid shape, large at the base where there were lots of children and young people, and narrow on top where fewer people survived into old age. As the decades passed, the U.S. population grew rapidly thanks to high fertility and immigration. It kept a pyramid shape with ever-growing bars at the bottom as more children were born and shorter bars on top because of short lifespans. In 1930, that started to change. Fertility rates fell after the start of the Great Depression, and by 1940, we see a narrow base on the pyramid, a squeeze on the population that will carry forward through the decades. The drop in fertility reversed by the 1950s, however, and with the end of World War II, the U.S. experienced a baby boom alongside rapid economic growth. Even though the baby boom ended by 1970, it will continue to ripple through the population as the boomers age. Already by 1990, the population is aging, even before boomers reached middle age. At the bottom of the pyramid, we can see the young millennial generation, while at the top of the pyramid, there are more older women than men, as women tend to live longer. By 2020, the first decade of population projections, the pyramid has changed shape. We can see the baby boomers, now as older adults, and the millennial generation, which will have aged into adulthood by 2020. We can also see that the pyramid is lopsided at the oldest ages, with women outliving men. Because of longer life expectancies, women aged 85 and older will continue to outnumber older men. As people continue to live longer, the pyramid is projected to become top heavy in the coming decades, so that finally, by 2060, there will be more elderly than young children in the United States. We project that people aged 80 and over will make up 8% of the population, while children four and younger will be just 5%. Gone are the pyramids of the 19th century, replaced by the pillars of an aging population. Okay, what did you find interesting about the change in the pillars, if you will? You can unmute. Were there any surprises? Hi, this is Kimberly Carter. I was surprised or had not given much consideration of thought that there would be a day or could be a day when 
older people really consume the majority of the population. I never really considered that until now. Okay. Okay. Remember with your that younger generation aging and your older population living living longer. When I refer back to that um, our C-suite meeting where individuals realized that more than half of the group were over 65, but of that group, there were already um, four that were in their 70s and were still functioning um, and productive, but it was obvious that there was going to come a time when they were going to to um, to leave and to and to move on, if you will. So, what is it that we should do, knowing that if we do, we can we as we assess what our workforce looks like and um, how our workforce is aging and what it'll look like in ten years? What do we need to start doing? Yeah, that's fine there. If when 2030, you know, 2030 seems like a far off number, but really it's not. <laughs> We're in 2022. And so we talk about the number of individuals that are, will be retiring out. So what do we need to do to get ready for? What are some of the things that you are seeing in your work environment that we're doing in order to get ready for that? I don't think that anyone is preparing for that. I think that they're kind of maxed out with dealing with this newer generation and adapting to their uh, work style. Um, but it, it was interesting seeing the progression in the chart. Um, it, it seems like the the government should be preparing <laughs> more strategically for the change of dynamics in age, right? Um, you could see when you had the, the baby boomers is because it was uh, more feasible for people to have more children and they had a better quality of life, right? I, I'd be interested to see how the government is looking at preparing for the change. It's similar to what's going on in China, right? And, uh, and how the government is preparing for the change and the numbers. Right, exactly. Yeah. That are that, that are going to get ready to pull um, from resources. So, and and I and you make a very good point in that. Um, I I will talk from the personal experience is that um, our organization just thought people would be there. People were working well, it, they were being productive and did not think about the individuals leaving until they started leaving. And you know what then was realized that there was, there was nothing put in place for the transfer of knowledge. And when you had individuals who had been working with the organization for years and maybe working in different areas, there was they were critical knowledge there was critical knowledge that needed to be passed on. How could one do that? How could we plan to do that? Make sure that the, the, that, the, that critical knowledge does not walk out the door at the retirement party. What can we do? We have some comments in the chat that I would like to read. Mm -hmm. um, Rena Ramsey said we need to change our expectations about work, workforce, makeup, and who we are willing to hire. Kimberly Carter shared transfer of information, succession planning, reviewing benefit packages. Carrie Lee shared succession planning, and Leanne Bauer shared mentoring. I also wanted to add on to the government piece. Um, I know this might be a little bit off topic, and I might be wrong, um, but it kind of makes me think about the abortion laws and I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, it's just just watching that video and just seeing how, how the numbers have just changed, but it just, it made me automatically think about the abortion laws. Mm-hmm. 
though. I don't want to start about, a You look back at the at history and you sort of can sort of project what can transpire. It was interesting that um, uh, when I got my teaching degree decades ago, the um, and graduated, there weren't that many teaching jobs because people had decided they were going to pursue careers and not have children. And so they, and teachers weren't leaving. So there weren't any teaching jobs. I ended up in government. But now I'm looking at where every school district is looking for teachers. And there are different reasons for that. There's the mass exodus, individuals retiring and not preparing for that. And also that you do have, in, you do have uh, families or individual, more people are having children, if you will. The, um, I'd like to touch upon that mentoring. And that's so important. Um, mentoring, sponsorship. Um, some, some companies will have formal mentoring programs, whether it's formal or not. The importance is pairing up um, individuals so that they could learn from each other, if you will. So that mentoring um, and mentor, uh, the opportunity to mentor is, is really, really important. Succession planning, also very important. I don't know that we see a lot of that because all of a sudden, the, you know, it's a couple of months or a couple of weeks before an individual goes, is, decides that they're going to, going to leave. And so sometimes we get caught in the the day-to-day -day and the scramble day-to-day -to -day and we forget to do the plan. And so it's really important as you think about um, this group, the knowledge base that you have in there, the experience, the history, because sometimes as we're preparing for the future, it's important to know where we've been. And um, if you've just individual that's just come on the job for three or six months may not have that. And so it's just really um, the important thing is how do we make the connection? And, um, and how do we plan for that group of individuals? If, the, if you're that, that, that part of your staff team or workforce is deciding to leave, what can you do to make sure that they're that you still do have a transfer of that critical knowledge. You didn't have succession planning. There may have not been mentoring in place, but when your staff team decides to talk about, it's time for me to go, then maybe there's an opportunity to speak to them about a different relationship. Maybe they're with you part-time or maybe they're with you in a consultant basis just to make sure that there is a transfer of knowledge with your individuals that you already have there. Anyone else think of any other ways that we can make sure that that happens? I mean, now that we know, I think we can become more proactive about encouraging our leaders to create succession plans. Um, if you are at the table, it's something to uh, minimally bring the conversation up because when you think about it, um, it does place limitations and setbacks that, um, that then, in my opinion, ruffles um, the, the, the younger generation because now they have to go find the knowledge, seek the knowledge or um, create the knowledge and oftentimes is not correct because of the fact that it wasn't done like Susie Jo who's, who did it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And do you know, um, has, have the individuals the, been identified already that may be close to retirement? Remember that um, it's not about just turning a certain age and, and, and heading out the door, but you have individuals who are around at that age who may be raising grandchildren or taking care of parents and, that, and you still have a full-time job. It is, um, that can be particularly taxing. And so that you may have individuals who 
don't plan to retire, just make a decision of what, what's best for their family. And so, yes, that um, I agree. Um, that was Mr. Dixon, I believe he went off screen that um, prompt your leadership to do some more succession planning at all the levels, if you will. Okay, and we don't have any other comments, some really good um, comments there. Let's um, go on to the next screen and take this off of here. And so this was just some, um, some ideas around your knowledge transfer, which was um, uh, identifying where the where the, the the knowledge was sitting, and then um, how how do you connect them with key people in positions so that they would they could transfer that knowledge, um, have more of the integrated. So make sure that that maybe you have some mix up your teams so that people can get. Um, information and experience from others. Um, and then the, the part about educating and sometimes the staff doesn't have, maybe to begin to put that um, or package it, the, the knowledge base that they have. And then just monitor. Um, what happens often is that some Someone, businesses that have been with you 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and all of a sudden it's upon us. So, um, um, and then it, decide on how best that works. For, um, for the staff and staff. So your younger staff, how and your more seasoned staff is, how do you best communicate what you do, what you've done in the his, your history with the, with the organization? So with that, we're gonna move on. So, you know, we've talked about the aging of, of um, America. Now we're going to talk about the browning of America. And yes, uh, it was interesting that um, as part of the work we were doing with DEI that probably about eight or nine years, we um, presented some information to our um, diversity, in, uh, equity and inclusion committee um, around what was coming, the graying and the browning of America. So we've been talking about this for a while. So how do we make sure that we prepare for this or we should have been preparing for it? Now, there were three major factors that were highlighted around why we were, the, because of the browning of how, explaining the browning of America. Most of your immigration was coming from non-white countries like from Latin America and Asia, Southeast Asia, um, the rate of interracial marriages and multiracial people is growing rapidly. Um, in 2015, seven years ago, 14% of the newborns were multiracial and that 17% of the marriages were interracial. That number has grown. And so um, that was another reason that, or another explanation around the browning of America and that birth rates were low in America. And in many states, the um, white deaths outnumbered the um, births. So we've had um, this phenomenon, if you will, where individuals were living longer, aging, and then we have that the, the fact that we were now experiencing more individuals that were identifying as um, multiracial or multicultural. So with that, we're gonna move on just to hear from um, some of, uh, in a second we'll hear or talk about what some of your corporate leaders are saying about the work and addressing that. 2020 is the year when the majority of the Americans under 17 were from a minority background. Now remember, this is the group that's aging and will now be in our workforce, depending on your business, they might be in your workforce already. And so 
with knowing that, that the demographic changes, they're going to bring some transformation on how we do the work. Have you been seeing that in your spaces? The minority to majority. Let's see if I can see the chat. What demographic changes have you seen in your um, spaces? Okay, we have yes. And then we have not in leadership and decision-making positions. Okay. And so um, Dr. Baker, is it okay to call on you and just ask you to elaborate on that? And what are either challenge or advantages to that? Yes, ma'am. Sorry about the screen. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So while we've seen an increase of uh, hires, diverse hires. We've seen those diversity hires at the lower end of the spectrum, whereas the decision making and the people who are hiring still remain at mid management level, still remain at a uh, significant um, majority, I guess, of the people. I would say the in group uh, still remains at the powerful level, at the C suite level. Uh, we may have one or two representatives, and even in those one or two representatives, that, uh, and I'm going to use the word black and not BIPOC in this particular case, um, you find that those representatives don't ha may have a seat at the table, but don't have a voice at the table, if that mm. makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're hiring uh, black women, specifically, I'm seeing black women being hired in diversity, equity, and inclusion positions, more so at the VP level, given the title. But when it comes to making particular decisions around metrics and influence and those specific, the, the, the area that they wish to influence and were hired to influence, they have little traction with uh, making those efforts come to fruition. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And that is not a um, specific to, to the space that you're in. Um, we find um, that you'll have that hire of the minority um, uh, black women or women of color in those diversity spaces. Um, and that is when we're not productive because we're just checking the box. And so it's almost going back to, um, I have a Hispanic person in my department. Yep. Or I had a, you know, I have a person of color in my department. Um, and so that, um, if, uh, you know, so, so that is not productive at, at all. That is not any way to retain your talent because today individuals want to see themselves in these positions and positions where decisions are being made as many of them would aspire to get there themselves. And so um, it still is about protecting that power base and, um, once you get to the table, can you make sure that you're heard and that um, what you bring to the table is valued? And so that's still, I believe, a, a, a constant um, struggle, if you will, that checking the boxes can be very um, ineffective, if you will, in that, um, that the fact that you can say that you have an individual or one or two individuals doesn't mean anything because the, your your talent pool today is looking to see what you're doing they're looking mm -hmm. to see what type of impact you're making and back in the day i'll say from dating myself again we were looking for jobs mm -hmm. many of your individuals now are looking and they tell you all the time, I want to work in something that I love to do, something I'm passionate about, something mm -hmm. I believe in. And if that's what, if that's who you're trying to attract, individuals that are coming with that type of energy, it won't happen if you're just checking the boxes. And so as spaces, as, as companies begin to look at and really um, believe 
that they have to operate differently, then that's still going to be a, um, you know, a problem. What you described, you could have described 15 years ago. That's a little scary in that that doesn't speak to change. In well, some I agree places. with you. I'm sorry. Excuse me? I was, I was going to say, I agree with you, Lydia. The efficacy hasn't moved the needle, right? We haven't seen a needle move in efficacy mm -hmm. even from the 1960s. And I would also offer, so what I do is I, I coach executives and uh, I do provide leadership training. So I have a wide variety. And now what I'm seeing with Black females are they being asked to go into these positions and they're not necessarily the first DEI position. They're not asked, necessarily asking the correct questions going into the position, but given the title, assuming that they have authority. Uh, and what they quickly realize is when they don't have the authority to really push forth that effort, they're just going to collect the money and be looking for that next job. And quite frankly, they're at a premium. Quite a few companies, I'm in Northern California, so we deal with Silicon Valley. There are quite a few companies are looking to pay a premium just to get somebody in that seat. And uh, so you're seeing people bounce from company to company to company, taking more and more dollars uh, and not really making an impact. They're building their portfolio and not and not provide not delivering anything for for the group that's supposed to serve, if you will. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We had another individual that commented in the chat. Um, you want me to read it or you got it? I'm sorry. You want me to read it for you or you got it? No, I did. I if you can read okay, it. Okay, we way. have. We have a couple um, comments. Um, Rena Ramsey said, I wonder if you applied the same analysis to minority majority demographics using race and leadership level, if you would not find that the pyramid that existed for age exists for race. We have Cheryl Milton Roberts. I was coached not to get into the DEI space until I had work experience on the business side so that I would have more credibility, connections, and experience. This was years ago, but it sounds like it may still apply to some degree. And I believe she was commenting um, and agreeing with Dr. Dr. Baker. Totally agree, the change has been very slow. I'm seeing the same work being done in corporations that they were doing 20 years ago. Okay, the other thing that happens um, those were excellent comments. The other thing that happens is that individuals are hired um, and a, the, that DEI position is often seen as a feel good position. How are you gonna make the staff feel good? Um, and so there has to be some strength to that voice. And often that um, the in, one person working in that space is not enough. So that has to be a network. So you have to develop that internal network around the work and you have to also build your external network um, so that you can bounce ideas off or see what is working um, in order to um, you know in order to expand that that conversation, if you will. Um, it, it's um, the we come a ways, but then when we sit back and you start to dissect it, we're still in, in some spaces, we're still in the same, same space. If you're looking, um, we, we had the opportunity where of the uh, 12 individuals in the C-suite, there were five, which was a, a big thing then, that were um, minority or multicultural. As individuals left, they were not replaced. And so you almost hear and find that there was a lot more activity around lifting individuals um, years ago and now um, you've hit, hit a wall. And so I am going to uh, make this statement and please comment, comment on it because I have heard, I have heard this from 
um, several individuals that they are not seeing your um, individuals of color moving into spaces because of female leadership. And so um, I was asked to continue to consult with um, uh, an organization that I was with and they felt they couldn't see why individuals were complaining that there wasn't enough diversity at the leadership level. They felt there was because you had um, three white females in the top three positions of the organization. Thoughts. Okay, it's like being in school, raising your hand. <laughs> Dr. Baker? If no one else, and I really don't wanna hog the, 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 our, our time here, but I will say the CRA, the Civil Rights Act was specifically addressing gender and race right off the onset. That's what led to the, uh, us doing minority women owned businesses. Um, that's what led to us creating some type of equity within the, the workplace. Today, we have infused into our race and gender other stuff. And the end of the, the, if we look at the very end of where we are today, the same people who we were trying to build equity from our white males are now receiving the benefit through the same organization in the same premise that we set out in the CRAA. And that looks like white women, that looks like the LGBTQ community. And so while we set out to address race and, race and gender inequities, when the people who set out to do that aren't being, aren't being fulfilled in that position, if that makes sense. They're, they're not reaping the benefit of the hard work of our brothers and sisters in the 1960s and 70s as they uh, you know, before that effort. Um, and it, it's, hard for, it's hard to see that our white males are still in those leadership positions, but calling themselves something different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, it, and it's hard um, to, to even have the conversation. It's a hard conversation to have. So when I'm called into um, the uh, into a meeting and the three individuals that are talking to me about engaging in DEI work, and I have to tell them, I said, you know, this doesn't re represent diversity. I understand that in some spaces um, uh, there should there needed to be more work to provide spaces for, for, for women and for women to, to move forward and, and hold certain positions. But your community and you work in minority communities do not see it that way. Um, I'm reminded, uh, Dr. Baker, of the um, how in order to get minority businesses in, um, to be able to get government contracts, especially with uh, DOT um, and DOE, uh, that uh, you had to certify as an MBE. Then it became an NBDBE, disadvantaged business, minority business. And then it was a MBE, DBE, WBE. And so what happened is opportunities were going into back to some of the individuals who already had had the opportunity. I see two more chat. Oh, okay. Okay, you must have started typing and then decided to speak. <laughs> I believe um, Cheryl Roberts wanted, I think she raised her hand. Cheryl, do you still wanna come off mute and share? Yes, we'd love to hear from you, Cheryl. Is 
It looks like her audio is trying to connect. Okay. Well, when her, and we can we can allow for that comment at the time that her audio, you know. She yes, she to... said that she um she thinks that is common. Okay. All righty. Okay. Well, we're gonna move on because um I had to laugh at myself when I was uh prepping for this is that I pulled a lot of information and then I realized we only had an hour <laughs> because this is a conversation that could go on um and so what I um what I looked for was to get um information from uh some of your leaders for some of your uh corporations this particular young lady and I cannot see the bottom but I believe she's with Nielsen and so she just spoke about how America was in the middle of a demographic revolution, revolution is what she said, and that companies had to change um, how, how, um, that how, they, how they did the work, so to speak. What's interesting, and I thought that there was the emphasis on how do you reach these different communities? How do we take our brand and make sure that uh, the consumer comes to us for our product or services. But it's the same type of intentionality that you have to have when you are looking at building your talent pool. So um, reaching out is, isn't enough. And with your consumers and your, your consumers today, you have to be authentic, whether you're speaking of the product or services you're delivering or just think that your, your organization has a brand. And now individuals are looking and selecting very carefully who they become a part of. And so we'll go on to the next. Um, so it, it is a new day. And so we have to think differently and we have to plan differently. And so some of the changes that organizations are considering are new consumption patterns and different communication needs and the way we receive communication or prefer to receive communication, distinct attitudes and behaviors. Um, when you think about it, leadership today is going to have to be or recruit talent that are fluent in multicultural marketing and talent acquisition. And so you often hear that we will hire um, those that look like us. And so that's, you know, that's something um, that, um, that, we have to, that we have to think about as our communities are look, beginning to look so, so very different. Any comments? Okay, we'll go on to the next. And really what we're asking, and um, in light of recent events of civic um, unrest in the last few summers, there are some companies and leadership that do wanna do the right thing. What does that, and what does that mean to do the right thing? Thoughts? Okay, let's go on to the next and we'll uh, kind of the marketing and, and, and so part of doing the right thing is you're marketing and promoting the brand, whether it's the company or the, your product and services to customers um, or in your talent rec uh, recruitment. Okay, you're it is, I'm sorry. Oh, you're, okay, you got on. Cheryl, was that you? It's been kicking me on and off. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I can, you're on now. Okay. <laughs> she went back off. <laughs> oh my God. You know, when technology works, it's great. And when it doesn't, it's, you just have to roll with the punches. Right. So hopefully she can come back on or type very fast, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. 
So I see you. All right, but you're still muted. So we have to talk about equity, access, opportunity, and inclusion. And then the thought that multicultural is mainstream now. And when we talk about um, uh, making sure that we are creating space for this group that, that's multicultural, we need not forget um, that we already had individuals in our space that didn't have access and opportunity and were not included. And so that that is a very, you know, very important point to make sure that, that, we, that we keep in mind. We're going to move to the next one as I'm seeing that our time is running out. And so um, this uh, gentleman was from, um, and I cannot see, and he, of course, he escapes me now, Brad. Um, if you're not growing with the multicultural consumers, then you're going to have a problem because every the majority of the eight the population under 18 is multicultural. And so, um, his recommendation or suggestion was that we should always reevaluate who you're trying to reach, and that's whether you are it's product and services, or you're trying to recruit and reach individuals to join. Um, and so that that is, um, and of course, if you could do that at, in, in this country, you could, you're shoring up that muscle to be able to do some, some of your work internationally. Okay, in the next, um, General Mills, he was with General Mills. And so one of the things I thought interesting about this was that General Mills was trying as they were recruiting talent to give them something that they could latch their passion onto. And so they just not only produce food, but they were focusing on reducing hunger and on regenerating planet. And so that would have given and, 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 and would tout the impact that they had in these spaces. So for individuals that that um, provided the opportunity to, to connect with a company that, um, that shared some of the passion that they had. Next. And so we know that um, at McDonald's uh, and their and of course, international, but this um, uh, this global CMO spoke about um, that when they kick off projects, there's a round robin grounding on the insights from all the different segments, so that they would pull together. Whether it is um, your um, within your talent pool or focus groups in different uh, segments of the community to find out exactly what it is that they want and how it was best to, to connect with them. Next, I keep going for my own key to, 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 uh, to move the slide forward. So um, they, um, she mentioned the total market approach, which was leading with multicultural insights to drive the marketing strategy. But then you had to think, so who, who, were, who, who were providing these insights? And so they have gone to pulling together groups and going out right into the communities that they want to impact to, to get feedback from them directly. Next. Um, we spoke about succession planning for staff, but this, um, gentleman with P&G speaks about having a, a, a comprehensive plan on how you're going to outreach to get um, products and services out there or for talent um, recruitment. And um, his recommendation is you don't build a plan and then just latch this part, the DEI part onto it, that it should be built into the plan. Um, from the very from the very beginning, and so we are. Culture is the new marketing currency, and so uh, this young lady is with BET. 
she was formerly, I know, with uh, Coca-Cola. And she um, and her statement or her quote is that we've gone from multicultural marketing to marketing to a multicultural world. So brands can no longer win if they've not steeped in and committed to advancing the culture in a meaningful way. And so she also mentions, you know, that the, um, you know, we just don't reach out to this, we'll just use the Hispanic community just during his, ha his Hispanic Heritage Month. That's a 12 month um, campaign that you should have. Um, and in today's world, cultural credibility is the pathway to commercial viability. And so we're going to move on to the next. So how can we help to steer our work environments? Seek that public knowledge from your current teams and individuals that you're trying to recruit. What are their aspirations for their careers? What are they looking for in an ideal work environment? What civic projects are they interested in and look, and look for a level of commitment from, from the company for? Do they believe in the company brand? Is the current um, team providing input into the cultural public knowledge or uh, transfer? So go on to the next one. There are challenges with ta talent recruitment, um, diversifying the workforce, but the company doesn't tend to, um, to attract diverse talent. So that means that you have to cast a wider net and partner or collaborate with other entities that can give you that um, diversity in your workforce that you're looking for. Um, if you're not seeing it in the, in the college pipeline, so to speak, have the conversation with those institutions of higher learning around what you're looking for. And um, so that they can see fit with how they can modify curriculum, if you will. Um, be very conscientious and authentic about taking steps to advertise, recruit, fairly hire, and provide opportunities for all segments. And so with that, um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, you know, the browning and graying of America comes with challenges, but together we can strategize and turn the challenges into energy to affect change. I wanna thank everyone for attending and for participating. And um, Amber, I wanna thank you for the um, invitation and your support today. Um, I look forward to connecting um, hopefully with sometime in the future.